Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I'm Susan Checkout Sigmund, Director of Marketing and Program Development for the Friends and Foundation of the Rochester Public Library. Welcome to Book Spanish Kim. We ask that you please silence your cell phones at this time. Our thanks go to those who help fund programs like these through FFRPL, the dedicated FFRPL committee members who curate and organize these events, our guest speakers and artists who so graciously share their time and talents with us, the library staff who help with our setup and production, and the thousands of people who attend each year. We are live streaming the formal portion of today's program to the library's YouTube channel. If you need access to the induction loop service in this auditorium, please adjust your hearing aid to the T switch. FFRPL raises funds, presents programs, supports special projects, helps to create specialized spaces, and purchases supplemental materials and equipment for the Rochester Public Library. And I'd like to give you an example from each of those categories. Fundraising is a cornerstone of our mission. The success of our most recent fundraiser for the Shoulders to Stand On Endowed Fund qualified us for a $10,000 matching grant which will eventually support LGBTQ plus staffing, resources, and programs at the library. We, of course, present programs such as today's BSI Review and our annual Sokol High School Literary Awards. The awards ceremony and reception will be held Thursday, April 25th at 4 p.m. here in the Kate Gleason Auditorium. FFRPL is a founding sponsor of the annual Art of the Book and Paper exhibit. The deadline for entries for the next show is May 15th. Artists can complete their online entry at rockcitylibrary.org. And FFRPL is proud to help fund, present, and promote this special project now in its 13th year. FFRPL also helps to organize and fund murals at Central and throughout the branch libraries on an ongoing basis. The most recent two specialized spaces include Sean Dunwoody's new portrait of Frederick Douglass at the Frederick Douglass branch in late 2023, and new interior murals at the Wheatley branch that were just installed this past month. For the last five years, FFRPL has purchased New York State Empire Passes for every MCLS library, including central branches and towns. These supplemental materials provide free access at New York State parks and the State Department of Environmental Conservation, including forests, beaches, and trails. In 2023, the Empire Passes circulated from the library more than 2,000 times with activity at every member library in the system. And you can borrow your Empire Pass with your library card, courtesy of FFRPL. Today, we'll hear a review of Crossings by Ben Goldfarb. Goldfarb investigates road ecology, such as animals killed by cars, a million a day in the US alone, invasive plants traveling on tires, water contamination from road salt, and the impact of noise pollution on songbirds. And he outlines innovative solutions to better serve ourselves and nature. Our presenter today is a 40-year veteran reporter at the Democrat and Chronicle who covered transportation, the environment, public health, and conservation. Please join me in welcoming Steve Orr to our podium. Thanks all for coming. I, uh, I hope I can fill you in a bit on this book. Um, as Susan said, it's entitled uh, Crossings, How Road Ecology is Shaping the Future of Our Planet. In brief, the book's about roads, their impact on wildlife and the natural environment, and steps that have been taken or could be taken to lessen their impact. It's from the library of works that illuminate a de devastating environmental problem about which most of us are ignorant. Sadly, this library grows ever larger. The New York Times named it one of the 100 notable books of 2023. As Susan said, I was asked to talk about this because during my time at the DNC, I did cover transportation, I covered the environment, and I covered many other things. 
Uh, and by the way, I should remind you that the newspaper is on strike and you shouldn't be reading it right now. <laughs> Perhaps I shouldn't even be talking about it, but at any rate. Um, so, uh, so that's why I'm here. Um, Crossings was written by Ben Goldfarb, as you see there, who uh, grew up in suburban New York City and now lives in the Pacific Northwest. He's in his late 30s. He's written many top magazine, for many top magazines uh, and has written one other book called Eager. Would anybody like to guess what that is about? Beavers, yes. I have not read the book, um, but I did run into a naturalist a few weeks ago who had read it and she thought it was great. So now when I picked up this book, Crossings, I wasn't sure if I would rank it as great. The topic seemed a bit obscure to me. I thought maybe it was a presentation of solutions in search of a problem. But as I began to read it, I decided I was, for the most part, wrong. Goldfarb makes a strong case that roads, both large and small, continue to have a profound but sometimes subtle impact on flora and fauna around them. I found him to be a very good writer, given to vivid descriptions, unexpected comparisons, and more than occasional puns. I pulled a few of them out as, oops, hold on, I see I'm reading here and I'm stopping. I pulled a, a few of his pithy passages out um, and, and this, which is mentioned in the book. It's a, something that illustrates that people have been concerned about cars killing animals for more than 100 years. It's a magazine cover. At any rate, um, there's some other slides that have passages from the book that I thought were particularly apt or interesting. They don't necessarily correlate with the, where I'll be in my talk, but just when you get tired of listening to me, just you can read those. <laughs> All right, so the thing uh, about Goldfarb is he was also a tireless researcher. He worked on this book for 10 years, and he says he talked to at least 250 people. He often visited the locations he wrote about, traveling to Minnesota, Montana, Florida, Oregon, California, Wyoming, Idaho, Alaska, New York, Tasmania, Wales, Costa Rica, Brazil, Canada, and more. He got his hands dirty reporting, helping trap animals for study, collecting roadkill along a mountain byway, and carrying frogs across a busy highway with other volunteers. And he's no dispassionate observer. He expresses wonder, delight, and anguish as he writes. He cares about his subject. And, you know, as is the case, that makes the book better because he puts, throws himself into it. Um, and that was one thing I really liked. Um, you know, as the name of the book suggests, and as Susan said, the book explores road ecology, which is the study of how life changes for animals and plants near roads. Of course, for centuries, people have built roads for foot traffic, for horses and oxen and carts, then for motorized cars and trucks. Without a doubt, roads are among humans' most significant developments and are central to the way we live. But, as Goldfarb points out over and over again, roads have always impacted the surroundings through which they moved. As they became ever more numerous and the traffic ever more intense, those impacts have skyrocketed. Roads alter or outright destroy ecosystems they pass through. They bring industrialized society's ills to places to the wilderness, enabling rampant deforestation, for instance, in places like the Amazon, which Goldfarb documented when he went there. And they harm animals who live near them. Goldfarb tells us that concern about roads' impact on animals dates back more than a century. Wild creatures of all shapes and sizes have been losing their ability to wander freely, whether migrating for seasonal reasons, moving into new territory, or looking for mates, food, or water. The author devotes a considerable amount of attention to the many ways in which this happens. Let me share just a few. In a chapter about national forest lands, which are crisscrossed by 370,000 miles of dirt roads built for logging and firefighting, and Goldfarb says, by the way, the forest, U.S. Forest Service manages the, world, the largest manages more miles of roads than any other entity in the entire world, 370,000 miles. He writes about elk that are frightened to cross these little used tracks because they associate them with Hunter. In another chapter, he talks about traffic noise, which invades most of America's forests, plains, and parks, pushes animals and pushes animals out of their preferred habitat. Even a three decibel drone, barely audible to humans, impedes the ability of owls and foxes to hunt for food. 
Researchers played traffic noise through loudspeakers they placed atop a roadless Idaho mountain that was a stopover for migrating birds. As Goldfarb points out, they found many species simply stayed away, but the ones that did stop there when they trapped them and studied them were thinner and less healthy than their kindred elsewhere. As Goldfarb ruefully points out, national parks are a particular noise problem because, thanks to lobbying from the auto industry, most of them were designed expressly for visiting in a car. In the Pacific Northwest, Chinook salmon populations crashed a few decades ago, and one big reason were culverts, the ducks that carry streams under roadways. In many cases, they're impassable to migrating salmon. Goldfarb also highlights a classic case of habitat disruption at Banff National Park in Canada in the Rockies. The Trans-Canada Highway was built right through the middle of a valley at Banff that's home to elk and deer. So many animals died, they began to call that stretch of road the meat maker. In California, a small number of cougars have always lived in a wilderness portion of the Santa Monica Mountains that's surrounded by the Pacific Ocean and the traffic-clogged 101 and 405 freeways. They rarely were able to escape their 240-square-mile enclave. They were afraid to cross the highways. The colony was inbred and dying. Bobcats, coyotes, and other animals were similarly stuck. We'll talk about what was done there in a minute. But you know, cougars are relatively rare. Goldfarb devotes considerable attention to an animal that's anything but rare, deer. To my surprise, you know, I learned that white-tailed deer, the kind that we have around here, had lost so much of their habitat and been slaughtered so wantonly by European colonists that it all but disappeared by 1890. There were hardly any left anywhere. Hunting bands helped white tails recover, and as Goldfarb informs us, the population grew quickly after World War II, as did, of course, the number of vehicle deer accidents. He describes kind of a feedback loop. New expressways and feeder roads fueled the post-war suburban boom. Those new suburban neighborhoods were full of the lawn forest edge habitats where deer thrive, and thrive they did. Goldfarb said there were eight to 20 deer per square mile when Europeans arrived in America. Today, many suburbs have 100 or more deal, deer per square mile. Now, of course, the high capacity roads that facilitated the creation of all that suburban deer habitat were populated by fast moving cars and trucks, which began to run into and kill those very same deer in huge numbers. By 1995, the official estimate of vehicle deer accidents hit a million per year and experts said many more went unreported. More recent figures put the number at 1.5 million accidents reported each year, plus 59,000 human injuries, 440 deaths, and $9 billion in damage to property. As Goldfarb says, this makes deer the most dangerous animal by far in the United States. There are an estimated uh, 900,000 deer in New York today, by the way, with 60 to 70,000 deer vehicle collisions a year officially. The author relates how studies of deer deaths on highways in Wyoming and Pennsylvania led researchers to figure out data that's key to road ecology, the interval between passing vehicles that either encourages or deters a deer from trying to cross a road. If the gap between cars is more than 60 seconds, and if you think about it, that's a pretty big gap on a highway, the deer will go for it and they'll usually make it. If the gap is less than 30 seconds, they'll be reluctant to try crossing, although they might. If it's under nine or 10 seconds between cars, or that, which breaks down to roughly 10,000 vehicles a day, they won't even think about it. The road becomes a moving fence, as he calls it. Locally, DOT stats show that I-490 in the more developed parts of Rochester has enough traffic that it's an absolute barrier to deer. 490 at Penfield Road has 48,000 cars a day in each direction, for example but nearly all other roads in our area have traffic counts low enough that deer will gamble to cross them. And of course, sometimes they lose that bet. The DOT told me that more than 1,300 deer vehicle collisions were reported in Monroe County in 2022. The actual number is likely several thousand higher. Goldfarb goes west to the Rocky Mountain states to introduce the engineered response to the deer car crisis. Wildlife passages that allow animals to move under or over busy roads. They were pioneered in Europe 
but highway officials in this country were slow to pick up on the idea of wildlife crossings. The breakthrough came in the West, where mule deer, pronghorn, and elk are migratory, moving into the mountains each spring. <laughs> and apparently this is a particularly profound part of the talk. Uh, uh, moving into the mountains each spring and back down again in the fall. They used long-established routes. Goldfarb details a number of tragic episodes in which huge numbers of mule deer and pronghorn died at the edge of the road or on the road because their routes were blocked by newly built expressways. Eventually, wildlife biologists began to experiment with ways to encourage the ungulates, as they're called, to go under the road rather than across it via existing drainage culverts that passed under the highways along the animals' migration routes. The biologists learned that placing several miles of fences on either side of the culverts would channel deer into them, and placing natural material on the culvert floor, stuff as simple as straw, would make them more attractive. Deer and pronghorn fatalities fell dramatically where these existing culverts were used, but highway officials were reluctant to do more because of the cost of adapting old culverts or building new ones. Then, in 19, or 2009, some road ecologists thought to calculate the average cost of a deer vehicle accident. They put it at $6,600 in vehicle damage, medical care, and loss of funding opportunities. When they carried the math further, they, should, they were able to show it would save society money if underpasses were built below any one-mile stretch of highway where three or more deer died each year, which is a lot of places. Once highway officials in, in the western states absorbed this knowledge, they began to build new wildlife passages under highways, designing them to be safe and attractive for deer and other animals. It's become a phenomenon there, in, and it's a, a, a government initiative, essentially, that uh, even uh, red state folks have embraced greatly. Um, one of the road ecologists who did the math that led to this rash of new wildlife passages told Goldfarb, it was the most important work he'd done in his entire career. So, you know, western mule deer and elk took to these because they migrate in predictable routes that intersect highways. White-tailed deer don't migrate in the same way, and road engineers in the east were reluctant to build underpasses here. But research eventually showed our deer do move in predictable ways between resting spots and sources of food and water. If a road's in the way, they'll try and cross it. So our deer then will use wildlife crossings if they're put in the right places. To date, though, like many eastern states, New York hasn't gone all in on wildlife tunnels or bridges. The only large wildlife underpasses I could identify in the state were culverts installed year ago, years ago under I-87, the Northway, in the Adirondacks. For some reason, the, the deer don't use them. People do, though. That's what a study found later. In the last several years, uh, to give credit where credit is due, the state DOT in our region completed two uh, bridge replacements over creeks in Wyoming and uh, Orleans counties that featured more modest wildlife benches, they're, as they're called, unpaved areas under the bridges that allow animals to cross the stream while avoiding the highway. One of them features stone ledges to serve as fish habitat, too. Kudos to them is what I say, and perhaps they could do some more. Um, you know, there uh, is a, as Goldfarb reports, uh, a, the giant infrastructure bill that was passed by Congress uh, three years ago included a landmark $350 million in competitive grant funds for states, local governments, or native nations to build wildlife passages. In December, the first 19 grants were awarded. None were in New York. Um, there is legislation introduced in Albany last year that would require DOT and the Thruway Authority to identify sites where wildlife passages would be beneficial so the state could then apply in the next round of federal funding. The bill passed the Senate last year, but not the Assembly. As of yesterday morning, it hadn't made it out of committee in either house. Don't ask me why. Goldfarb tells us that uh, well-placed tunnels under highways work well for deer and smaller mammals, but you know, large carnivores, deer and cougars were reluctant to use them. They prefer the open air. So the author traveled to Banff in Canada to explain the solution that allowed grizzlies to traverse the huge Trans-Canada Highway. As an experiment, officials designed and built two 150-foot-wide bridges over the highway. 
At first, they appeared to be a failure. There was no evidence grizzlies were using them, and the locals began laughing at them. But over time, that changed. The bears warmed to the bridges, and other wildlife joined them. The Banff Bridges became the most famous wildlife passages in the world. Road ecologists flocked to see them. In 2014, biologists from Canada joined that flock, consulting Banff's experts to ask if a bridge could, could be built to help the cutoff cougars in the Santa Monica Mountains. Two years earlier, a cougar dubbed P-22 had been found in LA proper in Griffith Park, home to the famous observatory and the iconic Hollywood sign, huh, an aptly timed slide. Um, this, I think, is like possibly one of the greatest wildlife photographs ever taken. Um, this was the animal, I believe, that was uh, featured on 60 Minutes, which I saw and probably a lot of you did too. So genetic tests showed that this big cat had come from the Santa Monica's, somehow crossing both the 101 and the 405, but unable to get back. P-22 sightings began to pile up, and he became a media star. His plight, living in isolation from other cougars and thus unable to mate, inspired a movement to build a wildlife bridge like the ones in Banff. It would connect the Santa Monica's with habitats to the north and bring genetic diversity to the cougar population. That movement, with funding from wealthy celebrities and foundations, raised more than $100 million. Goldfarb went to LA and hiked the Hollywood Hills with a woman that led that movement. Construction of the Liberty Canyon Bridge, as it's called, which is 200 feet long and nearly that wide, began in 2022 and will be done in two more years. It'll be the biggest wildlife bridge in this country. P-22, sadly, will never use it. After a series of confrontations two years ago with pets and humans, he was tranquilized and it was found he was dying of injuries suffered, ironically, uh, when he'd been hit by a car. He was euthanized. Goldfarb, though, doesn't just write about big glamorous animals like P-22. He spends a lot of time in his book on insects, birds, reptiles, and amphibians. In Portland, Oregon, he took part in a nighttime frog shuttle helping volunteers carry Portland's last red-legged frogs across three roads in a railway that separates forest from wetland. He called the work spiritually nourishing. Bucket brigades like this are quite common in this country and elsewhere. Sometimes more is needed. The author went to Florida to tell the story of a young herpetologist who personally ferried 11,000 turtles across the road, a road that had cleaved a wetland. He then created a makeshift turtle passage through a drainage culvert and then overcame ridicule from conservative TV commentators to win a federal grant to build a dedicated passage. Of local interest, I learned that concerned students at Cornell University were early adapters of this approach. They designed and got funding to build specialized toad tunnels on and around the campus 20 years ago. Goldfarb's chronicling of wildlife solutions also took him to Idaho to write about a program the Forest Service has to decommission roads and to Denali National Park in Alaska to witness a radical solution to noise pollution, a ban on cars, a limit on buses, and a halt to all traffic through the park for 10 minutes every hour so wild sheep can cross the road unimpeded by steel or noise. He went to Brazil where he drove on a road through a park purposefully made windy and hilly so motorists had to drive slow. The road closes at night so ocelots can roam freely. Monkey bridges, nets draped from the tree canopy over the road so little primates can scurry across, hung overhead. He visited Minnesota to learn about milkweed plantings on roadsides to support migrating monarch butterflies and traveled to <coughs> his home state, excuse me, of Washington to document how a Native American tribe had to sue the state to force it to repair or replace a hundred of those impassable culverts, or a thousand, excuse me, a thousand. I found all these stories compelling. As I said earlier, Goldfarb threw himself into this heart and soul, and he succeeded in making me, at least, a sympathetic supporter of wildlife passages. But I will say Goldfarb's car ran off the road, in my estimation, a few times toward the end of his 350-page volume. He penned chapters on roadkill and who eats it, waxing poetic about vultures and humans who devour dead doe for supper. He went all the way to Tasmania in Australia to discuss the moral obligation to rehabilitate animals injured on highways. 
He debated whether self-driving cars and trucks will be good or bad for wildlife and wrote about the impact on animals of the societal slowdown during COVID. He digressed to talk about the movement to remove urban expressways like Rochester's inner loop as a form of reparation for the often racist decisions to build them in the first place. A lot of this was interesting in and of itself, but to me it seemed a lot of it had little to do with the central point of the book. One can almost imagine Goldfarb finishing writing about wildlife passages then realizing he owed the publisher another 100 pages. So I, I mean, I may be unfair. Uh, I mean, I, I greatly enjoyed the sort of meat and potatoes where he talked about all the work that has been done or could be done to help many different kinds of animals. Um, and you may feel differently. I, you know, if you read this book, I, you know, you can decide for yourselves, and I think you should read it. To me, it's a fine example of conservation environment, environmental journalism, a collection of well-told tales that shed light on issues that few of us know anything about. Thank you.